This is Matt Mikewich, and you're listening to the Savvy Dentist Podcast. Welcome to the Savvy Dentist Podcast with Dr. Jesse Green, the show where great dentistry meets great business. Listen in each week as we bring you an inspiring person who will share their story, ideas, and business techniques to help you create a practice and a life you love. And now introducing your host, Dr. Jesse Green. Welcome back to the Savvy Dentist Podcast, the show where great dentistry meets great business. Today, I'm really pleased to be having a conversation about artificial intelligence and machine learning and what that means for society as a whole, but more specifically, what it means for small business. I'm joined today by Matthew Michaelwitz, who has more than 20 years of experience in starting and running high-growth tech companies, especially in the areas of predictive analysis and optimization. He's currently the CEO of Complexica, a provider of artificial intelligence software for optimizing sales and marketing activities. He is regarded as one of the smartest and sharpest entrepreneurs in the country and he's helped many other entrepreneurs on to achieve their own success. He's a really lovely guy. He's an incredibly smart, incisive businessman and he's got lots of wisdom to share in this particular episode. We cover machine learning and artificial intelligence and where it's come from and where it's potentially going. We talk about the areas of disruption and what that means in specific niches and what it means more broadly. And we talk about the general trades required of an entrepreneur to be able to adapt and change in an ever-changing complex environment. It's a wide-ranging interview with Matthew. He's got so much wisdom to share. As always, I'd encourage you to take notes because there's lots of things here that you're going to want to take into practice and put into action straight away. So without any further ado, here's Matthew Michaelwich. Matt, thanks so much for taking the time out of your day to come and hang with us at the Savvy Netters podcast. How's things in uh, sunny Adelaide? Oh, fantastic. Finally, some good weather. Summer is definitely here, so it's uh, marvelous. Fantastic. Matt, I've been following your work now for some years. You've been you know, very active in the IT space with Solvit and Utech and, of course, now with Complexica. I've been following your work particularly in the field of big data and artificial intelligence and you know, seen various interviews with you on Sky News, reading some of your blogs and publications around that. And today, I really wanted to have a conversation with you about your thoughts around big data and AI because I know that's the space in which you're active and which you work. Yes. And then kind of look at the ramifications for business in general and then drill down from there. But before we get into that, I'm wondering how did you find your way into this space and and what's been your background to to move into into such a dynamic and forward-thinking, fast-moving field? Yeah, that's a a good question and, and it happened by accident. So my father is an artificial intelligence scientist and has been for the last 40 years. So Ever since I started primary school at the age of six, I would go to the university after school and wait for my father to finish. And I would play on the computer in his office while he had conversations with other professors or PhD students about neural networks and machine learning and the Turing test and so on. So I grew up in an environment and a family where that was the, the thing that was focused on. That was the profession. So years later, when I graduated from the university, my father and I created our first AI business together, which was about 20 years ago, to commercialize his technology that he developed at the university. So it wasn't something that I got into because it's fashionable or it's trendy or a lot of people are talking about. It's something that I really grew up in. Given that you grew up in that environment and you've been seeing the changes over the last couple of decades, what has changed over the last decades when it comes to neural networks, machine learning and the like? And I guess where do you see the trends taking us over the next few years or even a decade if it's easy enough to predict or not? I'm not sure. I think the predictions are difficult, but what has changed in my view, and and there's been periods uh, in history where various approaches to machine learning or artificial intelligence showed promise and then disappointed. So there were a lot of times in the 80s, then again in the 90s and so on. But what's changed probably over the last 10, 15 years is a convergence of factors. One, computing power has gotten exponentially cheaper, which is important. The second one is the sophistication of algorithms has increased, specifically the arrival of deep learning, which is based on neural networks and the approach that that took. 
And uh, thirdly, and just as importantly, the amount of data available to train these algorithms has exploded through the advent of the internet, the number of images available, text, documents, and so on. So you've got faster computers and they're cheaper, you've got more sophisticated algorithms, and the training data sets have increased. And that converged into more sophistication, which we're experiencing today. Okay, so there's a whole lot in that. Look, before we dive down and you know, really unpick some of those thoughts and threads there, for those people listening to the show, many people have an understanding of AI or big data, or at least you know, have an understanding that we've held true. But from your perspective, is AI and big data well understood, or is there a bit of a misconception about what it actually is? And, and if there is any misconception, I'm just wondering if you can give us a bit of a run through on what it actually does mean. First of all, I don't think it's well understood. Like a lot of terms that have gained mainstream prominence, I I think awareness is high. You could go to someone and ask them, you know, have you heard about AI or big data? Most people would say yes. And then if you ask them to provide an explanation, uh, that that will be more challenging for people. But with time, I mean, the understanding will become more uh, ubiquitous and uniform. But a really simple explanation is, you know, AI is a, a concept, really. How can we artificially recreate what the human brain does, interpret information, analyze information, reason, make decisions, learn, adapt, and so on. It's a, it's a general direction. And the recent rise and prominence of the, of the term machine learning is really the, the tool, the algorithmic application of some of these general concepts of AI. So what we're trying to do is not create in the this has been the greatest change in AI over the last few decades. Instead of creating a program where we the program runs and executes some tasks to perform a various functions, we're trying to create machine we're trying to create programs that actually teach themselves how to do things. And uh, and this is very similar to how human beings uh, learn. We're not we're not born with a pre-programmed set of instructions that we execute after being born. We're born with a machine in our head that allows us to learn, adapt, discover, and so on. So this, uh, this is really what AI is about, how to recreate these processes that human beings naturally exhibit and capabilities that we're born with, and how can we embed those into a machine so a machine can do similar kind of things. So is the machine able to do so much of that work now or is the necessity of a machine doing so much of that work coming back to the point that you had there's so much data around now? Is it, is it now that there's so much data around that it's virtually impossible for the human brain to process that? Is that why we've moved so rapidly to machine learning or is it just a, a labor-saving device or is it a combination of different things? Well, there's various application areas of machine learning and artificial intelligence, everything from analyzing images or surveillance videos to draw out of that data some correlations and insights and so forth. So I think if you go into very specific applications of this kind of technology, you can get a very good result. The machine can do things faster than a human being can do, and in some cases can do it more accurately than than a human being can do. But those are very specific and narrow implementations of the technology. And I think we're a long, long, long way away from a machine that has the general capabilities of a human being. So where we're getting a lot of success are the narrow specific applications, but the general concept of AI, a machine that can replicate the brain and interact with other people and reason and collect information and, you know, all of, I, I think that's a long way away. Yeah. In the health space, we hear about the internet of everything, humans having different sensors to be able to detect different sets of biometric data and whatnot, and, and then, of course, you know, make diagnoses from that. So perhaps one of the narrow applications might be around health as well. Have you had much experience or, or much insight into how that might occur in the health space? Yeah, I sit on the board of directors of a company called LBT Innovations. It's a publicly listed company, and they've used AI and machine learning to create a machine that sits in pathology labs and analyzes biological culture samples from people and analyzes the image of those samples to make some kind of determination of, of what it is. So it's, it's something that has traditionally been done by human beings, and all of a sudden you're now training a machine through, again, all of these images that are available. This is this, this is that, and so forth. And then the machine at the end is able to replicate that process at a rate of accuracy equal or even greater than human beings. And this is a, a project that went on for a long time and it got FDA approval last year. 
or, or the year before, and now it's being introduced into the market. So I think that's a great example of a very specific and a narrow implementation of AI and machine learning, and it can do a remarkably effective job. And, and again, going back to my initial point, faster than human beings at a similar rate of accuracy or greater. Yeah, which is really an interesting thing because, of course, that leads to the conversation around disruption. And we see in lots of industries there's talk of disruption, whether it's driverless cars or other transport applications around that as well. But health is probably going to be one of those areas disrupted as well. One of the things I wanted to ask you is what particular industries do you see most likely to be disrupted? Lots of good questions in there. So let me make one comment and then I'll answer the question. Over the last, let's say, you know, even 100 years, there's been a drive to reduce the cost of performing activities. And, that, and, and that's because it's the nature of capitalistic society. If you have a business, you want to try to make that business more competitive by reducing your input costs, reducing your processing costs, so you can become a lower cost producer, become more competitive, reinvest in innovation and the like. And the same goes true in even nonprofit organizations like government, health, and so on. You have a certain amount of money and uh, costs are increasing, and, and if you can find a way to automate tasks or do, do them more efficiently, there's more money left for other activities. So there's been this general drive. It's not new. It's been around for a long, long time, and where it has manifested itself, the greatest has been in manufacturing. Look at a production line 100 years ago when Henry Ford was around. Look at a production line today. It's all robotics, automation, and so on. So what's occurring recently is this automation is moving from what has been traditionally blue-collar jobs, people on a production line, to white-collar jobs, people in offices, to the professions, etc. And now to answer your question on what is most likely to be automated first are the jobs that are the most repetitive and routine. So if something is done systematically in a very similar way, day in, day out, within some set parameters, those are, and it's done by high-value people, then those are going to be the first targets for automation because they, they make the most economical sense and they're the easiest to execute from a technology point of view. It's done repetitively, so I can train a machine to do that, and it's currently being done by high-value labor, so it makes economic sense to introduce technology. Right. Okay. So that's that's going to be massively changing the landscape of the way things happen across society more broadly. There'll be potentially different industries having to reshape and rethink how they go about their business, but equally there'll be a whole lot of people needing to reskill and find alternate employment as well. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're, and that's been the history of mankind over the last 200 years, the industrial yeah. revolution, the technological revolution, et cetera. I think you know, I think it's a utopian thought and an unrealistic one and, and, and quite naive to think the world's not going to change, things are going to remain fixed. The jobs we have today, those will be the jobs we have in the future. This is what the world will look like. The only constant in life and business is change. So there's constant change in every single part of the world and countries. Borders are redrawn. Businesses rise and fall. New inventions are created. Change is constant, which means that we have to adapt to that change. Some job categories will disappear. New job categories will emerge. It's just the way of the world. It's been like that and it will continue to be like that. Yeah, absolutely. And whenever there's change, there's opportunity. So I guess rather than looking fearfully into the future, where do you see the opportunities lie in that particular space? Where do you see the, the money to be made? Where do you think that the, without expecting the predictions to be 100% accurate, where do you see the opportunities lying over the next five to 10 years? But but from whose perspective? From a big business perspective? From a consumer's perspective? Well, let's 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 look at it from both perspectives. Let's look at it from a biz, big business perspective because I know that's the field in which you operate. But then let's have a look at the the opportunity for smaller businesses and and perhaps even what they'll need to be doing, focusing on their customers and the like. I could generalize by tying it all together into uh, some common trends that are impacting all of those players, big businesses, small businesses, individual consumers, and many of these trends are actually being dri driven by individual consumers. So as an example, two very powerful trends that have emerged over the last 15 years or even decade are personalization and on demand. Mm. So if I go back to, you know, when I was a kid, one of my favorite shows was the A-Team. And if I wanted to watch the A-Team, I had to sit in front of the TV at a set date, at a set time, and, uh, and watch it. And if I wasn't there, well, tough luck, I didn't get to see it. If you look at today's younger generation, 
It's what I want, when I want it, on the device I want it, I can pause it, etc. And, and this is a completely different mindset and approach that is being introduced into the world. It's, you know, look at Uber. You can have transport on demand. You walk out onto the street, you represent the supply, uh, sorry, the demand, and uh, Uber will visualize the supply for you, show you what uh, is available to fulfill that. So these trends of personalization, I want it personalized to me and I want it when I want it, are wrecking havoc in a lot of businesses that have been set up over the last many, many decades to standardize things. Like Henry Ford famously said, you can have any color as long as it's black. Because that was great from a manufacturing point of view. Standardize, standardize, standardize. And now the world's being turned upside down because I don't want black. In fact, I want it this specific color and I want it on this specific day and I want it to look in this specific way. So I think a lot of the opportunities that are uh, being created and a lot of the disruption that is being created sits in these kind of trends where all of a sudden big companies have been set up from a standardization and a uniformity point of view to provide certain products and services to consumers. And then all of a sudden, a new technological company comes along, like Netflix, for example, and says, hey, you know what, that, that, that model is old now. Here's a new model where you can consume what you want, you can consume a little or a lot and, and so forth. And all of a sudden, it creates disruption, but it's sitting on the back of very real consumer trends that are drive, that are enabling that disrupt, the disruption. So that's where I see a lot of the opportunities for companies to provide consumers what they're really craving. And, uh, and a lot of big companies have you know, come to prominence through those traditional models in the 70s, 80s, 90s are very poorly equipped to compete and reconfigure their business for this new world. Yeah, so, okay, so there's, that's where the opportunity lies in terms of personalization and on demand. Just moving to a slightly more local perspective, I know that you're dealing with large corporations, hundreds of millions of dollars and whatnot, and of course, most of our audience don't operate in that space. They're operating in small business, local dental practice areas, and maybe there'll be some working in large corporations, but notwithstanding that, for the smaller business to be able to get ahead in that particular environment, what would be your thinking around that in terms of, is it just going to be really focusing in on the customer? Is it going to be dialing in on that human to human relationship? What's your thinking around that? Yeah, I think that's a good point in this two parts to that one is any small business should always look to become more competitive. So if you look internally into a company, any, any company, even a very small one, whatever they do, can they do it at a lower cost without sacrificing quality or the customer experience and so forth? So never, I think, in the history of mankind has there been so much innovation as there is today. So many new products and technologies being introduced into the marketplace, a completely new paradigms being created like 3D printing and so on. And I think the small business owner that is oblivious to all of this change and innovation will miss out to the other small business owner, potentially their competitor, that is tuned into these trends and begins adopting them for, to increase sales and marketing, to reduce their processing or input costs, costs, et cetera. So I think there's this component of small business owners being focused on what's available, what's going to be available to help them become more competitive. And the other part of it is being customer-centric. The world's changing very quickly, which means customers are changing as well. If your small business deals with corporates or with other businesses, those customers you have are being impacted in one way or another. And if you're not customer-centric, if you're not focused on your customer, you don't know what change they're experiencing and how it's going to impact them, again, you're missing out on opportunities to assist them, and you could become irrelevant over time. The world moves on. Your customers have changed. You've stayed in a very fixed mindset, static mindset, and you don't have a business anymore. So I think those are the two things that are really important. The small business owner needs to be cognizant of what's happening that could help them become more competitive, and they need to be very tuned in into how their customers are changing and how their needs are changing so they can change along with it. I couldn't agree more. I think that the, the world is certainly changing quickly. And even we see that at the coalface in, in the dental practices that we work in, yeah, the, the, the customer journey, the customer experience that we've had in the 70s, 80s, 90s is very different to the one we have today. And certainly the technology that we use is obviously different as well. But Matthew, I wanted to just take a slight tangent for a moment because you're very well known in entrepreneurial circles. You've won a bazillion different awards for being a fantastic entrepreneur with the various businesses you've had. And I know you work with other young entrepreneurs as well. 
One of the things I'm curious to understand, because in your current role with large companies and big data and AI and, and whatnot, that that's all, well, we've had a conversation on that, but I'm curious to understand the entrepreneurial habits or traits you observe in successful entrepreneurs with whom you work, because one of the things I've observed is as things change in, in our neck of the woods, in the dental part of the world, the need for sharp business thinking has increased exponentially that gone are the days where you could sit in your practice and, and business would just walk through the door to you. So I'm just really curious to understand some of the work you've done with the young entrepreneurs in, in your local community there and what do you see as the common trends amongst those people who have really made it and done, done well? Extremely good question, and it's something I'm really passionate about, not only being an entrepreneur, but training and educating other entrepreneurs as well. And there's probably a whole set of traits, but if I had to boil them down into a few that are really important, one, you you can never overlook the importance of just hard work, persistence, and, uh, and dedication to something. So a lot of people become entrepreneurs, like AI, because it becomes fashionable. It becomes some glitzy term that is thrown around and, and gosh, uh, all of a sudden, I, w- I want to try it. If you become an entrepreneur for those reasons, you'll discover that it is incredibly hard work. It's nothing like you thought it was going to be. So the people that can stick it out, that can put in the, what we call the hard yards and really get through that experience of starting with nothing, with a sheet of paper, you might not even have an idea, and persevere through to the stage where you've actually got a business with office employees, customers, intellectual property, revenue streams coming in, that is a very, very difficult thing to do. And so you can never underestimate the importance of just hard work. The second trait, and and this is equally important with the first one, is to be flexible and adaptive. So entrepreneurs that are very fixed in their view towards something, and that something could be their idea. They fall in love with an idea, they fall in love with a product they've created, they fall in love with a concept, and then behavioral finance, they they call this concept confirmation bias. They look for information that confirms their bias, their view, their attitude towards something. Those entrepreneurs have a very high likelihood of failure because they don't see the signals that really the idea is half-baked or it doesn't work or it's going to fail for various reasons. So the entrepreneurs that are flexible where they say, this is my hypothesis, this is what I think at the moment, and as I engage with the market and collect new information and distill it and analyze it, whether it's information about potential competitors or customers, etc., are the ones that are most likely to pivot their idea or tweak it or change and then hit upon the final idea, which is the thing that, you know, will ultimately make them successful. So if you don't have hard work ethic, if you've got a very fixed mindset, chances for success are, uh, are quite low. And probably the last one is if you've never been an entrepreneur before, the chances of success are, to be honest, low, especially in technology and high growth companies. And in a great book called The Founder's Dilemma, they call it the newness syndrome. It's, uh, you know, I think 60 or 70% of first time entrepreneurs fail. They just don't know what they don't know. So if one of those entrepreneurs entrepreneurs is able to team up by co-found a company with an entrepreneur that has done it before, the chances of success increase dramatically as well. Because now you, you do know what you don't know, and doing it a second time allows you to benefit from someone's mistakes or successes or know-how. Yeah, so again, there's so much uh, wisdom in that, Matthew. And one of the things for the entrepreneurial-minded dentist listening to the program, a couple of key points there is there's no substitute for hard work. It's not an easy road at all to hoe. And being adaptive and flexible, of course, is critical. And, And I really resonate with the idea of the first idea that you have might totally tank but you've got to be able to adapt and tweak and change and, and keep trying until you get there. And, and as you've already said, Matthew, plug into those people who have done it before, get some advice so you, you know what you don't know and, and you're not kind of flying blind into things. To add to that, Jesse, there's a great book called How Will You Measure Your Life? And I forget the author's name, but it was, he's a Harvard uh, retired now business professor. And he opens each chapter with a business story and then translates it into what does it mean for personal life? And One of the chapters opens with a great statistic, and it says that out of all companies that are created and still exist 10 years later, which is a very small fraction of of those, uh, 90% of those that are left are not doing what they originally set out to do. And it's an enormously enlightening statistic. Let's say 90% fail. 
So you've got 10% that are left. And out of that 10%, another 90% are not doing what they originally set out to do at the beginning. And he makes a great statement. Those companies that are left are the ones that still had enough money left over to try something different when their original idea failed. So it just emphasizes this point of adaptability and flexibility. Even Twitter came out of a company, I think it was Odeo, which the, the original thing they were doing was not a success. And this was some, something that they pivoted towards. So there's, there's so much information around that that business owners can access around the importance of flexibility and being agile. Uh, yeah, and I think really for the listener to the program, I, I, I would encourage everyone just to kind of look up out of the four walls that constitute the dental surgery and look up and see what's happening around. Be aware of the trends, be aware of the changes, and look at where the opportunities lie. And of course, be prepared to adapt and change to things as they come across your path. And that's going to be critical for success and critical for survival indeed. And I don't think it's really reasonable to be able to sit there with your head down, tail up, drilling and filling teeth all day. It's going to be a matter of just looking at <laughs> what's happening and, and making the most of those opportunities. Matthew, I really wanted to take a moment to say thank you for taking the time out of your day to come and hang with us on our show Oh, my pleasure, Jesse. Look, as we wrap up today, I know you've got an incredible breadth of experience and I don't like to distill things down to simple bullet points, but I'm going to ask you to in a second anyway. I'm going to go against my own, my own thing here. But if you were to leave the audience with you know, one or two salient pieces of advice based on the conversations we've had so far, what would be, I suppose, uh, your, your one or two or three bullet points you'd stick on a bumper sticker for these guys to take away and go, right, this is something I really need to think about? Yeah, look, there's one in particular that really stands out. And I had lunch yesterday with another great entrepreneur. He's got a very big business, 200 million in revenue and so forth. So it, it illustrates that the questions I got asked yesterday are asked by people at that level of operation. And they're asked by people that are starting up as well. And the, the questions typically revolve around, should I do this or should I do that? Do you, do you think it's a good idea to raise capital? Do you think it's a, a good idea to go in this direction or hire this type of person, or et cetera? So there's all these attack, or even a, do you think this is a good idea or do you think I should invest in X, Y, Z? So there's all of these questions, some of them strategic and some of the, them tactical, that I often get asked for entrepreneurs. And I always give them the same response. And this is really the thing that I would leave listeners with to, to make sure that they do. I always tell them, look, do you have a clear vision for where you as an entrepreneur or business owner want to be in the future? And that vision could be in two years, three years, four years, you know, five years. I wouldn't go further than that. But do you have a clear vision and picture of what you want your company to look like, your role, what you want to be doing, and so on? And if you do, then the question you just asked me, w would it help you get towards that vision or would it take you in another direction? So in other words, what I find is people don't have a really clear goal or direction or objective for themselves and their business, and they struggle in everyday decision-making, especially important decisions, because they don't have the context of what they're trying to achieve, and that makes the decision difficult. But if all of a sudden the entrepreneur is able to say, hey, this is exactly where I want to be, this is exactly where I want my business to be, then all of a sudden the decisions get easier, because they can ask themselves, will this help? me achieve my future state? Will this help me realize my vision? And if the answer is no, forget about it. If the answer is yes, it's worth further exploration. So that's the most important takeaway. Have a clear idea of where you want to be and where you want your company to be and make decisions in the context of that future state rather than in some abstraction. Fantastic. And I guess having that clarity is key for everything. It's really it's the beginning point. And there'll be a lot of people listening to the podcast, Matthew, and just to drill down on that point, just one little bit further, people saying, how do I actually find out that clarity? Because for some people wandering around, they just don't quite know how to get there. They feel like they're walking around in a haze. You just, as we wrap up, any final thoughts about how to get that clarity? Absolutely. I mean, this, for different techniques work for different people, but what works for me is, and again, another observation, most people are so caught up in their business, just executing, just doing, whether it's <laughs> filling teeth or serving plates of foods in restaurants or developing software, they're just in it all the time, that there isn't the headspace and the time to abstract them, like take their, themselves out of the business and think strategically. So, so the first step is you need to remove yourself for a business, from your business, say for a day, and use that day to ask yourself these questions, 
when, say, a year passes or two years passes or three years passes from today, where do you want that business to be and where do you want to be? Do you want to be in the exact same position you are today? The answer is yes, just keep on doing what you're currently doing. That's likely to lead you there. Do you want it to be slightly different? Different in what way? How? For some people, they can do it themselves, ask themselves these questions. They can do it in their mind. They can begin writing things down. And for other people, it requires interaction with another person, a facilitator, a friend, a spouse, a partner. It doesn't matter to ask these questions. But you need a strategic planning session either with yourself or with someone else about your future and your business's future. And you need to create this clarity because everything starts with that. You don't have that, then you've got to ask yourself, what are you doing really? If you're not clear about where you're heading, what are you doing? It's the beginning. What do you want to achieve? Everything follows behind that. Right. So, ladies and gents, you heard it here first. Clarity is key. Ask yourself the questions. What do I want to be doing? Where do I want to be going? And really drill down and get clear about that because that is ground zero of your entrepreneurial journey. Matthew, thank you so much. You, you are such a gentleman, and I really appreciate you taking the time to come and hang out with us today. My absolute pleasure, Jesse. You're a gem, mate. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Savvy Dentist podcast. For more episodes, go to drjessegreen.com slash Savvy Dentist. And to discover how to build a high-performance dental practice, visit drjessegreen.com and download the free report.